Hey, my name is Yuri and I'm with Funnel Insiders. Today I'm going to be going over the $842,000 case study of our personal e-commerce store. When I say our, it's my business partner and I started this store a little over a year ago. We had no previous e-commerce experience and we didn't really have plans on selling the product we did. In fact, we started on Shopify and then we moved on to WordPress. So this is our personal case study um, of our personal brand and our personal store. Uh, we actually built it on WooCommerce and really didn't have uh, any previous e-commerce running or whatever experience that we did. So when we started this, we were complete noobs. We were listening to other gurus in the industry and following all the advice that you see in the Facebook groups and really had no idea how to do any of this. So I'm going to show you all of our successes. I'm going to show you all of our failures. I'm also going to show you all the things that we could have done better and the things that we should do right. So I hope you really enjoy this. Definitely pay attention. It's a long one. It's very thorough. But I'm going to tell you how I built the store, every plugin that I used to build the store, the marketing platform that we used for the store, and the strategies and all the details that we used in order to get us to this, this number. Okay, so pay attention. It's going to be a lot of good information. I really hope you enjoy it, and I can't wait for your feedback and to hear what you think. First off, I'd like to thank you for watching this. I hope that this case study will inspire you to start building up your own e-commerce platforms. This is how we made $842,000 in e-commerce with no product, no Shopify, and no experience. Just so you can see, this is our dashboard. You can see 841,000. There's some numbers missing, but um, it's actually 842. And you can see our net profit, number of customers, orders, our profit margin, and the number of items sold. So if you have internet ADD, I'll provide you with a little summary so you can skip ahead. We made $842,000 in about a year. We didn't have previous e-commerce experience, no plans on selling the product we ended up selling, we never actually warehoused the product. We did it off of Shopify and ClickFunnels. The store was built on WooCommerce and we never ran an e-commerce store before. Here's what I'm going to reveal. How I built the store, every plugin that I used, the marketing platform that I used, and the strategies on that marketing platform, including Facebook and email. But first, you're probably wondering, okay, why am I sharing this? Who cares? I want to help your store sell more, get more customers, and crush your competition. Truly. This is what's going to help you understand how to increase your revenue. I really just wanted to share my knowledge and get this out there. And I want to show you that this is indeed possible without any additional marketplace, such as Amazon, eBay, or the like. And really, I'm grateful for you taking the time and watching this. And who am I? My name is Yuri Vilk. I've been an online marketer since 2006. You saw me in the intro. I've ran millions of dollars in paid traffic on AdWords and Facebook. And I've helped people double, triple, and even quadruple their store revenue by leveraging funnels, upsell and downsell flows, and email marketing. But wait, if we're selling on e-commerce, there's competition. I've heard it all before. My answer, who cares? Seriously, who cares about your competition? Competition means that there's validity in the marketplace that you're running. Just because there's competition does not mean that you can't run a product. The product that we ran was extremely competitive. In fact, it was some of, one of the most saturated niches that we could possibly dive into. And it, the product was available everywhere in nearly every single retailer around. And yet we were able to set the value and the prices ourselves. Even though there was higher competition, we were able to outcompete the market and set higher prices than everywhere else. We were not competing for prices. Yes, customers can shop around, but when they're on our store, they can only shop on our store. Hence the benefit of your own store, not a marketplace. Here's a 30,000 foot view of the painful lessons that we learned. Number one, look at your numbers carefully. Number two, make sure you're managing your vendors. Number three, we learned Shopify sucks. Number four, research all your products. Number five, find a local vendor. Number six, train your team. Number seven, don't forget about your automation. And number eight, make sure you have a plan B. Lesson one, this was one of the most painful lessons I had to learn 
when I first started e-commerce. Now, before I partnered with my business partner, I started selling Skull products and merchandise off of AliExpress. When I met my business partner, he was also selling merchandise off of AliExpress. However, he was doing some significant volume at the time. I had to take a deep dive into the numbers. The reason is I really needed to understand what is our actual expense, what is our actual profit margin, how much are we actually making, and how much is everything costing. Now on the right you can see all the greens were positive days and all of the reds were negative days. You can see we have quite a lot of green and well we have some pretty big red numbers there too. The problem was though we knew we were profitable from the merchandising standpoint and advertising standpoint we didn't know if we were profitable but we didn't know if we were profitable with all the other expenses. Once you factor in app costs, employee costs, Shopify costs, hosting on Shopify and all the other little things that cost money when you're running an e-commerce business, including automation, including many chat bot, including all these details that are often overlooked in the big picture, we weren't really left with much. So this was a very big lesson for me. We had to really identify these numbers carefully in order for us to understand how we are going to actually be profitable and what we're going to do in the case we're not. What we were left with was minimal in comparison to what we were earning. So this was very enlightening to see. What you're looking at is a custom made spreadsheet of a two pivot tables that I combined both Facebook and the Shopify dumping in data and analyzing the raw data next to itself. So basically this is a compilation of all the data that we can actually look at and see all the details and metrics on one panel instead of looking at Shopify conversion rate and everything else in between. We can see everything right here. Now yes, I get it, Facebook Pixel transmits the data as well. However, the Facebook pixel often misses data too, especially on Shopify, which was another problem that we found. The second lesson is make sure you're managing your vendors. Now this is a picture of a bunch of tires and I was tired of dealing with AliExpress. I was seriously just fed up with dealing with the constant problems of AliExpress vendors. Vendors on AliExpress have a different perspective of fulfillment and how to manage their clients. Frankly, they don't really care when the product is fulfilled, when it gets to the end customer, and they don't really care about your reputation as a result. Because there's a lot of people marketing AliExpress products, they figure somebody else will just step in and take your place. It does not matter to them, your volume, or anything else. It's very difficult to get them to work with you off of the platform, so you're really stuck on dealing with AliExpress and their really, really low quality platform it's very difficult for you to actually scale effectively on that. Fulfilling on there and tracking is also problematic, especially during Chinese New Year. So it was becoming very difficult for us to actually get these orders fulfilled and we were getting a lot, large complaint volume from customers. We learned that our customers were really unhappy with the products and often cases the merchandise was low quality. Even though it was advertised as high quality, when the customer actually received it, they were not happy with it. Let's look at lesson three. Now we learned early on Shopify is a money suck. Everything they do is expensive. This is no longer Shopify Plus, but we were on the Shopify Plus platform at one point. Couple that with all the apps, plus all the additional expenses that are associated with developing your store, you're left with a very expensive store to run. Now, you don't have to deal with server costs, you don't have to deal with server maintenance, you don't have to deal with speed optimization, you basically don't have any of that control. Now this is a good and bad thing. Sometimes you don't need that control, but sometimes you do want that control. Sometimes you do want to have a CDN in place where you can actually control the speed of your website. Shopify does not let you own your website and sometimes we even had downtime or sometimes the software would crash and we wouldn't even know why. We would be missing data or we would be missing information or we'd be missing pixel fires, but there was no answer for it because everything was operating correctly. So there's a lot of interesting things that were happening in Shopify that we really couldn't explain. And then anytime we wanted to add a new feature, it's like we had to pay another monthly fee or a percentage of our revenue. So everybody was taking a piece of our store. And then what we were left with was very minimal in comparison to other stores. So all in all, Shopify is a great platform for, for starters. But the problem is when you're actually trying to get custom dev, development cost is really expensive. Because it's on the liquid framework, it can be really challenging to find good developers. However, on WordPress, it's relatively cheap to find developers and most of the plugins are already built. So it's really easy to find a bunch of plugins that you need that work well together, really have minimal conflict, and you have, all con you have full control over your server, you have full control over your speed, your database, 
accessing any files that you need, you have full control of your entire presence. This is something that was lacking with Shopify. We really couldn't go tinker with things if we needed to. We couldn't really figure out why things weren't working or customize every detail, including the checkout form. With WordPress, we can customize anything. So we finally made the jump. We migrated all of the plugins, all of the apps, all the customers, orders, and everything else over to WordPress. We finally had full control over everything. We basically had every feature that Shopify had and the site outperformed Shopify in terms of speed. We also had landing pages. We had e-commerce capability, unlimited upsell and downsell flows without revenue shares and full-blown email automation, far more than what Klaviyo and other providers can offer. It was between three and $500 per month with everything. That's including automation, landing pages, unlimited upsells with no rev shares and downsells and everything we can ever imagine on an e-commerce platform. So this, this was basically a behemoth that we can own and operate. And the best part is, once we have the site we build, it's ours. It's not Shopify, it's not on Shopify server. We're not sharing data with Shopify. Everything we own is ours. And their checkout flow is unique. So customers, when they would experience our site, it was different than everybody else. So we had a very unique approach in the marketplace. And we clearly were different in the marketplace because we weren't operating on what everybody else was, which was Shopify. So we had full control. Yes, it was cumbersome to set up and cumbersome to optimize and a lot more difficult to get it working the way we wanted it to because we had a lot of server optimization. But once we got through all the challenges, it was really a breeze to work with. And it, like I said, it was much better, much, much better. We were able to control every type of uh, status that we wanted with our customer service. We were able to really do anything we wanted to make sure our, our operations were running as smoothly as possible. And I was able to train our customer service team to react with the, with the correct statuses. Because this was a drop shipping business, we didn't have standard f fulfillment with shipping. Things didn't get shipped. You had to manually push the order along. In addition to that, I was able to significantly reduce our overhead, but still maintaining all the same features, like I said. One of the things that was also missing that I really didn't find useful with Shopify was the cost of the merchandise was not included in the reports. You always had to calculate approximately what you were earning. WooCommerce calculated it right in the reports. You knew exactly what the profit was every single day and you knew exactly what your ad spend was so you can make a quick calculation on the fly. You didn't have to have these giant pivot tables to constantly refresh and constantly determine whether or not you're profitable. We knew right away if we were profitable with WooCommerce. Let's go on to lesson four. Now we had a heyday with product investigation and product research. It was a lot of fun. I knew people who were selling copyrighted goods and as seen on TV products and really doing quite well with their volume. And they were doing you know, significant numbers. I'm talking five, six, sometimes six figures a day in revenue. However, we were very careful with that. We always try to avoid anything that was copyrighted or would infringe on somebody's rights or anything like that. We were very careful. So we chose a lot of what we thought were generic products until one day we got this. It was a copyright infringement from a gigantic company. This was a copyright infringement. Now, this is not a patent infringement. This is not a trademark infringement. This is a copyright infringement. I always thought copyrights are protecting works of art. So upon investigation, indeed, this was a work of art. They put this as a sculpture. So the plush doll that we were selling was actually a sculpture, and it was copyrighted as a piece of art. So we were unable to sell it. We had to remove all the products and refund all of our customers, and this spooked us significantly. We had no idea that this product was actually owned by another company. We just thought it was another, another product off of AliExpress that we can sell. And in fact, we were doing some pretty good numbers with it in the beginning. And we, we saw a lot of promise with this product until we got that copyright infringement letter. So I encourage everybody to check out the USPTO and copyright database prior to selling or drop shipping any products on the web. You don't know who, whose rights you might be violating, you might be liable. We were lucky enough where we didn't have to, have to engage in a lawsuit with the company because we backed off. We stopped selling the merchandise and we refunded all the customers who were associated with this product. And I know a lot of people who also sell illegal merchandise and they get cease and desist letters and people say, well, ignore them. Well, if you keep ignoring cease and desist letters, first off, you're infringing on somebody's rights. And second off, it'll come back and bite you. Counterfeit goods are counterfeit goods. If you're in a different country, it'll come back somehow, some way it'll come back around. 
It's the type of karma you're putting out in the world. We decided to play by the rules and find a product that just would not be copyrightable, that's not trademarkable, that's not anything. After this, we started searching for generic products. So we had a basic PPE campaign, and it was pushing like 10x ROAS, or return on ad spend, and about 10% CTR all, with 5 to 6 CTR link and a $5 per day budget. One day we woke up and we were like, we were looking at these numbers, we we're like, this is weird. How is this product doing so well? So I actually started digging in the numbers, and yeah, they were, not only was this product profitable, it was very profitable, and the numbers were outstanding. So this was when we found our product. So we decided to start selling it a little bit more aggressively and opening up the floodgates. Then we implemented our retargeting strategy and used our PPE model to scale the crap out of this. Once we scaled it up, we realized we had another problem. Once you find that this is going to be a working product in the marketplace on Facebook, all of a sudden your CPMs drop, the CTRs spike, both link and engagement CTRs, and you quickly see sales popping in because it's just unstoppable. People want to buy it. In order for us to really know how to sell this product, we had to really consult a bigger marketplace. That was Amazon. Amazon said, well, people who buy this product also buy this product. So we partnered those two products and married them together, and we created our first upsell flow. And as a result, people were about 35% in the beginning until we optimized it to get about 45% of people were taking the upsell, which was pretty significant. As you can see, it was significant volume. But then we ran into a big problem. We were actually fulfilling the product off of Amazon. We actually never had a vendor for this product. So we were just seeking one. So at the time we were just fulfilling it off of eBay and Amazon. And this really only got us so far because we had no control over pricing. We were at the total mercy of these vendors and they would jack up the price and then we had nowhere else to order from because they would jack up the price for us and everyone else would do the same. They would have poor quality or they would ship poor quality to our customers. We were dealing with basically the same thing as AliExpress. So we needed a different model. Come in lesson five, find a local vendor. So with this product that we know works, we got the upsell flow nailed down. We know that it's scalable on Facebook. Now we just needed to find the local vendor. At this point, we started searching far and wide. We contacted every single Amazon vendor. We contacted every eBay vendor. We contacted everybody we could to identify if they're able to handle our volume and provide the price that we needed. After about two weeks or so of searching, we finally got in contact with somebody. And they told us that they're not taking on any more drop shippers. And we were like, uh, well, what about the volume that we're doing? They said, well, we can't help you. So I ended up getting a phone number from one of their sales reps and gave him a call. I called him up and asked him, hey, uh, you guys still taking drop shippers? And he said, no, we're not taking on any more drop shippers. I said, okay, well, what about this volume? What if we're doing, you know, two to 300 orders a day? And he said, how are you guys doing that? I said, we have our own platform. Well, let me talk to the boss. He calls me back in about 15 minutes. He said, we, we can take you guys. He said, at that point, we were doing more volume than Overstock.com. And we were definitely on our way to make a, uh, some serious cash with this product. And we were already profitable, so it really didn't matter. Our margins were really, really good. So we ended up partnering with this company. And to our surprise, their shipping time rivaled FBA. It was about two days shipping time. And that's to, for the pro product to arrive at the customer's door. So as soon as we partnered, we knew we had to scale and scale fast. And so we did. We ended up putting up some manual bidding campaigns on Facebook. Once we know the product, we've, we've gone through all these hoops. We understand that the product works on Facebook. We know how to, uh, that there, our advertising is working on Facebook, getting great engagement. We're getting great numbers. All the metrics look solid. We said, let's push it. Let's push it as hard as we could. So we ended up turning on some manual bidding campaigns and we put up a thousand dollar budget a day and about 20 to 25 campaigns at a time. Uh, of course, we didn't spend the whole budget. We were managing our spend with our manual bids, not with the actual daily budget. Sometimes we would hit our daily budget on certain ad sets, but um, oftentimes we did not. And so then you just kind of feel it out. You, put the, you can put the pedal to the metal and really you feel the manual bidding. You really understand how, how the traffic's flowing and you adjust accordingly. And so in August, we did $134,000. And of course, manual bidding is very tedious to keep up with, but you can... You can eventually automate it with certain uh, software out there now. And this was pretty exciting and pretty scary. As, as soon as we got through August, you know, the holiday season pressed on. 
and we wanted to pivot to something a little bit more stable, a little bit less less uh, cumbersome to manage, like uh, like an auto bidding strategy. So we switched over to our art article marketing strategy. This strategy allowed us to scale without with with confidence, without having to worry about return on investment. I mean, everything was profitable. No matter what we did, no matter what placement we put on Facebook, everything was possible. We bid on every placement in Facebook. We bid on feed, audience, network, and everything else in between. We literally tested everything. Uh, and with our article marketing strategy, we were able to get our article in front of people. We were able to get users to click on our article, and from there, they would click on the product page. For our Facebook strategies, they included manual bidding, article marketing, advanced segmented retargeting, which is something we go over in FunnelInsiders.com, lookalike flipping, which is another strategy that we use for our article marketing, auto bidding, and interest targeting. We bid on basically every placement out there. This includes feeds, instant articles, in-stream videos, write column, suggested videos, stories, and audience network. Our primary creative style that was successful was a video. We optimized for conversions in a seven day click conversion window typically. However, we tested basically every feature on Facebook. As we were going through this process, of course, we were dealing with customer complaints and customer claims, and not just a small amount of them. We were dealing with pretty much the same volume that everyone else deals with. We had all sorts of product quality issues. We had all sorts of different complaints about shipping time and miss, miss deliveries and addresses that were not right due to the customer's error. Lots of problems. So I created a customer service handbook. I also created a fulfillment handbook. And I handed this out to all of our customer service and fulfillment reps. Each one of these different areas in these handbooks included a different area that a customer would complain. Once we had a complaint that a customer would experience at least twice, we would document it and create a process for it. So we managed the processes. And it didn't matter who the person was behind the process. All that mattered was we had a process for it. And you just follow the process and you'll be okay. We even did this with our claim handling. We did this with everything. And so we, we got everything down to basically a science where we knew exactly how customers would react at certain certain situations. In fact, if they wanted to return the product, we'd always offer them a coupon first. You know, if you're not satisfied, we'll give you a discount on the product right away. We also had to integrate the customer service platform. So the software that we use was Help Scout and Just Call. Just Call was our SMS slash outbound inbound phone service, and Help Scout was our inbound email service. And then lesson seven came around, automation. This is the crappiest part of WooCommerce at the time. Now it's solved. Before, this was a really big problem. WooCommerce did not have a good automation solution. So you can see this was about September or so that I finally got the automation integrated. That was a long time because we missed all the big sales and we weren't really using an email automation platform. You can see email did 36K, but we didn't even have any sort of automation platform prior to that. I discovered a way to do it with ActiveCampaign, however. Active campaign solved all of our problems. We were able to integrate all of our email automation all on one platform. So this is an overall view of the full email automation sequence for e-commerce. On the right, you can see that this is the bucket sequence. So after a user or has either purchased or has not responded or has not really taken action on our store, we put them into a nurture sequence. This is a nurture sequence on active campaign. Then we have the lead generation sequences. After a user opts in to receive a coupon or some sort of a lead magnet that would, we would be offering on our pages, they would go into these lead sequences. If they made a purchase, they'd become post-purchase sequences. So we would nurture them post-purchase and encourage them to buy the upsells depending on where they left off in the funnel. So we would constantly be encouraging the user to continue to buy even after they bought. So no matter what part they were in, they were always being nurtured and they were always being emailed. And this was all on one platform. So we didn't have to juggle Clavio and MailChimp and campaigns and this and that and the other platforms. It was all in one. We can see all the data on one dashboard. We can see everything on one platform. We didn't have to worry about going back and forth between platforms. And it was all integrated in our store and our store communicated back to ActiveCampaign, all the details. And so here are some of the store strategies that we use in order to get this kind of result. We use an optimized checkout flow for both mobile and desktop. The Google API allowed us to address, validate addresses and suggest addresses to users. We had upsell and downsell flows and cross sells, of course, and then we had email automation as well. This is all for the front end. This has nothing to do with the customer service. Our product was a trend, and we knew this was a trend. We knew it wasn't gonna last forever. 
because we were riding a wave. And so what we did was we decided that we're going to keep going and make a case study out of this. We were really interested in how actual e-commerce functioned. And because we had this opportunity, I wanted to share this with you. So our plan B is we're going to be helping you understand with our understanding of e-commerce and our understanding of how to generate serious revenue with our platform. We want to help you. I mentioned that there's a list of plugins that we used. If you want to know that list of plugins, visit the link and you'll find out more. And as well, the full list of software is available if you visit the link. Right now we're taking on clients. Like I said, we want to help you scale your business. If this resonated with you, or if you're interested in hearing a little bit more, all you got to do is book a strategy session with me. Again, my name is Yuri. Visit HTTPS colon slash slash www.funnelinsiders.com slash apply dash now. You'll automatically be redirected to a page where you can select your time and you can book a strategy session. After that, you're going to have to fill out a short application. This application is going to help me understand what kind of store you have and how we can help you. Anybody who does not fill out the application and fills out a time slot will automatically have their appointment canceled. You need to fill out both. So I look forward to working with you and I can't wait to see how we can scale your business together.